Hello and happy 2018. Welcome to the Goldberry Artisans podcast. This is a podcast mostly about knitting every once in a while, other crafty things I get into, and about learning as you go and being okay with making mistakes. My name is Emily. I'm coming to you from the beautiful state of Maine. And I am a college student working on a college student's time and budget. Today I am going to talk about my um, my works in progress. I don't have any... Oh, no, I do have one finished object. Um, my works in progress, my finished object, a little bit of um, drop spindling that I did the other week, and about my knit before list that I have been working on. Well, that I've put together. So first let me adjust my seat. I feel, I feel short. Okay, so I have one finished object and it's not even that impressive because I've been working on it for what feels like absolutely forever. Um, these are a pair of socks, obviously. Um, the pattern is the Grand Central Socks by Mina Phillip, part of her New York Sock Club collection. And I knit these in a Barocco Socks colorway, I don't remember the colorway number at the moment. And I did heels, cuffs, and toes in, I had, it was some leftover white yarn, I, it's either Knit Picks Stroll or Cascade Heritage yarn. I don't really know though. Um, yeah. And that was really for no other reason than decorative purposes. And I knit these toe up using the rounded toe pattern, or rounded toe instructions that Mina includes in that pattern. And then do the pattern across the foot. I did a German short row heel, which I had never done before. And then I continued doing just the pattern on the front, not on the back. One by one rib, and Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off. So yeah, I had never done a German short row heel. I have in the past knit my socks cuff down, and then I'll do a standard heel flap and gusset. Um, like the socks that I'm wearing today, were knit that way. Cuff down, heel flap and gusset. And I just, I like the way that it fits, but I think I've also typically only done some version of a short row heel on socks that ended up being a little too baggy anyway, so the lack of a really structured heel just made them even more baggy and likely to fall down. So I kind of want to experiment a little bit with sock heels, see how these, see how these hold up. Um, the German short row heel is not, it feels more fiddly than other short row heels I've done. I have not done the fish lips kiss heel, which is a, like you can, it's a paid for pattern. You can go on Ravelry and find it, pay a couple dollars. I have yet to try that. I have done just a regular short row heel, um, following instructions in this book, Socktacular from Knit Picks, which just gives really good basic um, options for cuff down and toe up socks, how to incorporate stitch patterns, how to use different, it provides different cuffs, heels, and toes that you can mix and match. So I've used short row heel instructions from he this book. Um, but I just found the German short row heel to be fiddly and it left gaps. I just feel like it left more holes. I can't really see when it's against itself, but if I put my hand in here. It just felt, I don't know if it's because I didn't pull tight enough, but I felt like I was pulling the yarn wraps as hard as I could, and it still ended up with holes. Now, it didn't end up with a gap, like, right in the corner, like I have, oh no, just kidding, I did on the side. <laughs> I 
And that's part of my problem with the short row heel is that I always end up with a hole right there with a heel flap and gusset. When you're picking up stitches, you can pick up extra stitches in that corner to make sure that you don't get that hole. But you can't really do that with a short row heel. So I mean, the jury's still out, but I don't see myself being super likely to do another German short row heel unless I wear these a lot and find that I really like it. Okay. So yeah, those, those are my only finished object. I, I cast these on in like September, maybe. <laughs> it's been a while. But these were basically just my backpack and knit during class socks, but not even that, because if I had another easy project out that I wanted to work on, I would work on that instead. I just didn't feel like making socks the last few months of 2017, so I didn't. I knit other things. Yeah, I've just been working on more, like, bigger things like shawls and sweaters lately instead of, instead of socks. And my cozy memories blanket for a while was my travel knitting when it was still small enough this fall. I could just put it in a larger project bag and bring it with me. Um, so that was sort of my mindless knitting, my travel knitting. But now it is way too massive to bring anywhere. So I finally finished these socks. So I guess I'll go right in and talk about my cozy memories blanket. It is getting huge. Um, I currently have, well, I think it's 13, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 rows. So I have 14 rows and currently 10 squares across, but I am adding in, I'm, I've picked up stitches and I am adding squares onto the side, so it'll be 11 squares across. And I'm doing that with some um, some yarn scraps and minis that Emily of Fibertown so wonderfully offered to send me. And I've kind of been doing like a kind of a gradient, like going from purples, this yarn, it's hard to tell, but it's purpley pink, some reds into oranges and a yellow, and then that will fade into some greens and blues. And that will take me all the way up to the top of my blanket. Um, so since I talked to you last, I've put in two rows of 10 squares and then I'm starting to add in that vertical, the putting squares in vertically. And I decided to add more width to the blanket because it, I felt like it was at the point where if I kept adding rows, then it was going to be a ridiculously skinny blanket for how long it was. Like I can put this, if I'm sitting down like I'm sitting on my bed working on it, it will cover my feet and come up, like come up to my waist, like up to my hips. So it's getting decently long, but I was afraid that if I just kept making it longer without making it wider, it would look, it would be a really odd shape. Um, I don't want a square blanket, but I also, also don't want a really skinny rectangle. So yeah, I've just been working away. This has almost sort of become my weekend knitting, like over the weekend. I'll just pick this up and work on it and settle in. And these, most of these two rows were completed with some other minis that were given to me through a set of connections from Sharon, who I know her daughter, so she gave them to her daughter to give to me. So thank you, Sharon. I love them. I especially love this yarn. I don't know what it is, but look at that gray with purples and yellows. I don't normally like yellow and purple together but I love it here. Yeah, it's just been fun mixing and matching, seeing what colors pair together. I just love this blanket, basically. But it, it's, I have to try to take a picture of the whole thing so you can see how big it is, because it's really hard to fit on the camera. I really hope I'm in focus. I'm sorry if I'm not. <laughs> so yeah, that is, oh, if I fold it all up, it's, it's big. I love it. I've actually started thinking about potentially making another one. Like if I want this to be, trying to decide, do I want this to be a lap blanket size or do I want it to be like cover my whole bed size? I can't decide. I may just, in my indecision, keep going and going and it will just grow forever. All right.
right, so I guess I will now talk about a pair of socks that I cast on, ripped out, and cast on again. I am just knitting a plain vanilla sock, and I'm using West Yorkshire Spinner's Signature 4-ply, and they don't put their color names right on their labels, but I'll put it on the screen which colorway this is. It's from their bird line. And I am knitting these on size zero needles. Now in the past I've often knit socks with size one or even size two needles when I first started knitting socks. Um, but I'm using size two needles. No, <laughs> I'm using size zero needles just because some of my vanilla socks um, after I've washed them a few times have gotten a little bit baggy. But my problem was that I decided to try decreasing my needle size and decreasing my stitch count, which was not a good idea. Um, I cast on, I think it was like 54 stitches, because I have made 56 stitch socks that typically fit fine. But I was like, oh, why well, not? Try 54 stitches. Don't know what I was thinking. So I cast on 54 stitches on size zero needles. And I got down, I did a heel, which I, knew, I was looking at them, I was like, yeah, they're kind of small, but oh well, they'll fit one of my little sisters. Like, I'm not dying to, it's not that, like, I need these. I cast them on to have a vanilla travel project. So, I knit the leg, turned the heel, did, a, did like an inch after the heel, did all the gusset decreases. Wouldn't go on my foot. So, I had my nine-year-old sister and my seven-year-old sister try them on, neither one of them could get it over their heel. So, I frogged, and did it again. I mean, I, it did not take me very long. It took me like three hours, maybe four hours to get that far. So, I just recast on with 60 stitches on, again, size zero needles. Um, so, even if they don't fit me, they'll fit my sister, but I'm pretty sure they'll fit me. And I have a pair of vanilla socks in West Yorkshire Spinner's uh, Wood Pigeon colorway, which is like purples and blues, and I love it. I love the socks. They're worn really well. I love how it stripes up. I enjoy knitting with it. And I like how on their label they tell you um, they are, it's 75% wool, 25% nylon. But the wool, the 75% wool, 35% of the wool in here is Blue Face Lester, which is just really cool. They, they include that on the tag. So I had more on those socks, and it just didn't happen. I think that ca the candle is messing with the colors. Hold on. There we go. That's better. I love my candle, but it was making it dark, too dark. Okay, anyway, my next project, still plugging away at this, is the mystery knit along pattern that uh, Lily of Nordic Stitches did through December. And if you are like me and still have not finished it and don't want to see any pictures, I'll put a timestamp on the screen so you can skip ahead to that part of the video. Um, but yeah, this is my shawl so far. It's a triangle shawl which alternates between this diamond lace pattern and seed stitch panels in two different colors. So I'm still, I'm in clue two, <laughs> still. I'm almost done clue two. And it's enjoyable to work on, it just, it is I do have to focus on it, which I've been obsessively reading over this Christmas break, so I haven't been able to work on it as much as I thought I would. But I'm still enjoying it. I'm knitting this using Knit Picks palette in the Bittersweet Heather colorway. Is this super dark brown? And I don't remember what this lighter colorway is. So... Yeah, that's what I, that's how much far, I've only knitted a couple inches since I last showed it to you. Oops. 
but I'm enjoying it. It's it'll be an, it looks like it'll be a nice good size shawl. It's getting too big. I may switch. These are interchangeable needles, so I may switch to a larger cable. So, yeah, still plugging away, working on that. And then what I've really spent the most time working on is my test knit cardigan for Annie of This Bird Knits. And I can't show you the pattern. Last time I talked about my, um, my gauge swatch. Can't find it. Um, but the yarn that I'm using is uh, Yarn on the House Mother, which is their heavy lace weight yarn. Sorry, I'm just kind of fished out so I can at least show you the yarn. Um, so, in, I'm using their shiitake colorway, and I have, I'm working on the sleeves right now, and I'm working on them at the same time, so I just took my last remaining, I finished up, I used like exactly two skeins of this yarn between my gauge swatch and then the, the rest of the sweater body, and so I split my remaining skein into two cakes. I just put one cake like on my scale and then used my ball winder to wind up until the scale said 50 grams. It's 50 grams in each. And I'm still, I'm loving working on this cardigan. I love the stitch pattern. I love the yarn. It's amazing. Um, but I thought I would talk a little bit about the wool because that yarn is 100 100% Rambouillet wool, which is not a breed that I have really worked with before. So I I remember last time I was trying to describe it and talking about it, and I was like, yeah, I don't really know a lot about, about sheep breeds. Well, behind me, sitting on the shelf, was Clara Park's Knitter's Book of Wool. I actually just recently purchased this. I bought it used online, um, which is how I buy a lot of books. And so I just thought I would talk a little bit about the characteristics of Rambouillet wool. Um, now if you're like me and you don't really know about wool, this may be new information. If I'm sorry if it's not. <laughs> if you're like, well yeah, doesn't everybody know that? Sorry. No, we don't. Um, so basically there are different categories of wool, going from fine wool, which is where Merino and Rambouillet fall, and just the the kind of wool that you can wear next to your skin, you can knit it for children and for babies, just the softer wools from fine wool all the way to the dual coated and primitive end, um, which is where like Icelandic and Shetland would fall. So it goes, so there's, I'm, I'm just using it, I'm, this is not my own information and research, this is all from Clara Park's book. And as I mentioned, Rambouillet is in the fine wool category. It's generally between 19 and 23 microns. So it has a shorter staple length and it it's suitable for next to skin wear and it's basically came from merino wool. So in what Clara Parks writes is after enjoying a monopoly on the fine merino wool market for some 600 years, Spain began to allow the export of merino animals to a few select countries by the late 1700s, and that's where the Rambouillet got its start. In 1786, King Louis XVI received merino sheep from Spain and installed them at his royal farm in Rambouillet, France. Although Louis perished during the French Revolution, the sheep were protected and the breed continued to evolve in France and later in Germany and the United States. Today, the Rambouillet is the foundation of most of the range flocks in the western United States. Um, and she goes on to say the Rambouillet is the largest animal out of the fine wool breeds. Um, it has a nice springy crimp and it's a more plump fiber and yarn. And because it has a shorter staple length, it's good when it's spun woolen, um, but it can also make lightweight or lace weight yarn if it's spun worsted and plied to 
mi mimic the breed's natural crimp structure. Now, I'm not a spinner. Again, I really, I don't know much about sheep and fiber and sheep breeds. So some of that, I don't completely understand <laughs> how you do that. The spinning with the natural crimp, I don't know. If you do, I want to be like you. <laughs> but yeah, just reading that kind of helped me see like, okay, so it is, it's a finer wool. It's, it's descended from the Merino. Some of the other breeds that fall under that fine wool category are CVM, Cormo, Polworth, Rommeldale, and Targi, along with Rambouillet and Merino. And those are some, a lot of the breeds that you often hear knitters talking about because those are the breeds that are easier to wear close to your skin, they're softer, so they're really good for garment knitting, which is what a lot of knitters do, garments and accessories. So yeah, if you are like me and you want just a handy reference, like because I would, I like knitting with other breeds of yarn and like knowing the specific breed, not just looking at the label and seeing that it's wool, but looking at it and wondering what it's made out of. And this is a, yeah, Clara Parks does a really great job. I haven't read all the way through this, but she does a great job of providing basic information on a lot of different breeds and also some patterns in the back of the book and she gives suggestions of what what types of sheep breeds fiber would be good for certain types of patterns like if it's a lace pattern and a cable pattern like what kinds of yarn excuse me what kinds of yarn would be good for that so yeah that's just the knitter's book of wool and that is all I've been working on. I really have not been working on a ton. I tend, I found lately I tend to be focusing on just a couple of projects, which is why even my, my mystery knit along has kind of sat by the wayside because I've been working on a test knit and on my cozy memories blanket. My sock is like my travel knitting. So that's what I've been working on. I have been doing a little bit of drop spindling. Um, over Christmas vacation, I think maybe it was last week or the week before, I decided, I had a free afternoon, and I decided to pick up my drop spindle again. Now, I took a class fall of 2016. I still want to say last year when I'm talking about 2016, but that's false. And I learned how to spin on a top whirl drop spindle. Hold on. I've talked about this a little bit before. So this is a top whirl drop spindle, which means that the whirl, whirl, it's not whirl with an I, it's with an O, um, is on the top. So you spin this, you hold your fiber up here, and then you wrap your fiber along this, the shaft as you go. So I've been using this spindle, I've been working on um, some mixed BFL from Port Fiber in Portland, Maine, and I've gotten a little bit done. I've got, I've got this much, and I've got a couple, a couple of balls of yarn, but it's a lot of fiber. It's, well, I mean, not a ton, 4.2 ounces of fiber, but I felt like trying a different fiber, but I didn't want to take this fiber off of that particular drop spindle. But I remembered that quite some time ago I had a friend who was moving had tried drop spindling a little bit. Didn't get into it. When we were younger we both used to knit. I kept going. She didn't. And she had given me a Turkish drop spindle. Which looks like this. Where um, the weight is at the bottom in this, in that crisscrossing shape, and this comes off, like this slides around. And so when you're spinning on this, the shaft is on top, you hold your fiber, and you wrap, wrap the fiber on the bottom, and it actually will create a center pull ball. I mean, as long as you wrap it correctly, which I did not do on my first time around. So I was experimenting with this. I did drop it a lot, way more than I did than I do with my other spindle, but it, I think it is just getting used to a different weight, a different, slightly different motion. 
I had received a gift of some fiber again a while ago because knitters are the best people and it is a Shetland it's a Shetland sheep fiber and this chocolatey brown was I think it was maybe two ounces hold on I have my scale so I spun this all in an afternoon it's not plied or anything it's still very uneven in spots I tend I found I tend to spin looser like I or I don't not spinning I don't twist it very tightly okay so the Shetland is 12 grams which is 0.4 ounces so yeah not, not a lot <laughs> um, but I tend to spin more loosely I think it because in my first attempts at job spindling I made some nice rope it was just so tight and so thick so I spin a little looser like there's a lot of still fluffy bits so I knit knit whew, spun that and then I get started in the same like it came together this is also Shetland this lighter tan color I'm getting a little ways on this now when I first pulled out this second drop spindle what I really wanted to do I have a, like a fiber bat which has more I think it's got some angora in it and it's just a lot more slippery and silky smooth and I enjoyed spinning off of a bat in the in the drop spindling class that I took and so I thought I would try it but I dropped the fiber broke and I dropped the spindle so many times <laughs> So I decided to try a more, a, a yarn that would be, or a fiber that would be easier to spin because it was more grippy and sticky and more wooly and would hold together better. And that was a good decision. Spun up the dark brown and then working on this light brown. Um, I still want to spin that bat of fiber, but that may have to wait until I can use my top whorl spindle again. But yeah, it's really enjoyable. Every time I pull out my job spindle, I remember how much I enjoy it. But my problem is that I do a lot of knitting. Honestly, I do a lot of knitting right, you know, like in the little time before I go to bed. I'll sit in my bed and I'll read a book and I will knit. Or I'll be reading a book on the couch and knitting. And it's I find it, I cannot yet spin while reading. Or I wish I could. Maybe someday. And so it's it's harder to multitask while doing it. And if I'm sitting in bed, it's really hard to use a drop spindle while you're sitting in bed. Tried. It doesn't work out very well. So that's just sort of been its convenience thing. It's more convenient and easier to knit than it is to spin. Um, but I'm really, I mean, I enjoy it, and now pulling it out, that was like a week and a half ago, now pulling it out, I'm like, oh man, I want to do this again. But school starts back up on Monday, so we'll see how that goes. And for right now, I'm holding it in my trundle bag from Matter Root. My cozy memories used to fit in here. Now, it most certainly does not. So that is all that I have for what I have been making uh, but I do have a list of things I want to make and I know at the beginning of a new year a lot of people make goals resolutions crafty and otherwise I didn't really this year the last couple years I've I just haven't really done that but I know that some people will make will go try to go on a yarn diet I tried that last year it did not work <laughs> um, or, and I also tried partway through the year, I talked about it a little bit on here, trying to knit like 500 grams of yarn before I could buy new yarn, but I just found that was really hard to keep track of. I just, I don't weigh all my yarn after I've done all my projects, I don't, it was just a lot to keep track of and I just never did it. But instead I was inspired by Maria of the Stitched in Sweden podcast to create a knit before list and this is a list of projects that I want to make some of which I've been wanting to make for a long time and I already have the yarn for them and I need to knit something from this list 
and complete it before I can buy new yarn. And I think that will be a lot easier to keep track of than knitting, saying like, oh, I need to knit a certain amount of projects before I can buy yarn, or knit a certain, you know, knit a certain weight of yarn. So some of the, the patterns on here are the Watershed sweater by Bristol Ivy, which is a lace weight sweater. Um, Autumn's Siren Shawl by Beatrice Perendalen, Tiger Flower, which is a stunning brioche shawl by Katrine Birkenwasser. And I also want to knit a faded sweater. I know by the time I actually get around to it, the craze will probably have died out, but, um, and I haven't totally decided if I want to use Andrea Mowry's, um, what is it called? Is it So Faded Pullover? Or a different one. Another sweater pattern I've been looking at is Uncomplicated by Alicia Plummer. I just love the look of that sweater. And I may do that in some faded yarns. Because I do have some really pretty hand dyed that I've bought over the past year or two that I obviously tend to buy yarn in the same color scheme because it goes together. <laughs> um, yeah, and I like the Georgetown Cardigan by Hannah Fettig and a couple other smaller accessories because I have the yarn for all those projects. I just haven't knit them. So what I did yesterday, I spent several hours caking up 27 skeins of yarn because all the yarn that I want to use for these projects came in, I guess, um, a skein that I had needed to cake up. So that way I have no excuse. It's ready. It's ready to go. Especially since school, like I mentioned, school starts up again, a new semester starts again on this upcoming Monday. So my knitting time is more limited in what time I have I want to spend actually knitting, not caking up yarn or anything like that. So I'm hoping in the next few days to knit a couple swatches for some of those, like the sweaters that I want to make. So then I can just cast on and go when I finish the project. And now that I've created this list, I want to knit all of the things. I want to just cast them all on, and I'm trying really hard not to do that. But we'll see. Yeah. So that is my knit before list. I've seen some people doing a, on Instagram, doing a make nine, where they pick nine garments that they want to make. It might be part of somebody's knit along, I don't know. But... And I thought about that, but this is kind of my version instead, because I honestly, with school, I'm not going to have time to knit nine garments. So I just decided to mix, there's one, two, there's three sweaters on here, and a few shawls, a hat, a cowl, so a nice a variety of projects, um, but I have one in this notebook where I just put a lot of stuff in here, what I want to do, different random notes, and then I have one that I posted on my wall in front of my desk, because <laughs> actually I made this like two months ago and then forgot about it. <laughs> so, until I was paging back in this notebook to find something else and I found it. So I put a copy up on my wall as well. So hopefully that will keep me on task to knit these beautiful things instead of buying more yarn, because especially when I don't have a lot of time to knit, instead of to still get that little rush of like feeling like your creative juices are flowing, if I haven't finished anything recently or put a cast on a new project recently, I will instead buy yarn. But that means that I now have quite a bit of yarn. I did recently go through, I have some that I'm going to de-stash, I get rid of it, but then I had a friend who's, they were renovating their house, she and her family, and her mom used to work at a yarn store years ago, and had a bunch of yarn that is currently sitting in some garbage bags in the back of my car until I can make space for it in my house. <laughs> uh. But anyway, so I have a lot of yarn. I need to knit this yarn instead of buying more yarn. Like, I wish that I could buy yarn from all the indie dyers and all the wonderful yarn companies out there and knit all the things, but I don't have time. So hoping this list will remind me of the beautiful yarns that I do have. 
And this list doesn't include like any socks or anything because I tend to just knit vanilla or really simple socks and that like doesn't even count. I just always have those. A pair going on the needles even if it takes me four months to complete it. So the last thing I want to talk about I guess is my little what's making me happy list before it gets way too dark to see. Um, I know I talked last time about how I was obsessed with Louise Penny's Inspector Gamache series. I still am. I just finished this past weekend book number 13 in the series, which is the most recently completed. It came out this past fall. This past August. Still obsessed. I read like from book 5 to 13 over this Christmas break and it was wonderful. And I guess an extension of that is that I've also been obsessed with the Father Brown TV series. It's available on Netflix. I'm not sure where else you could watch it. But it's a BBC series based on a character created by G.K. Chesterton. Who, and he's a priest and he solves mysteries or he helps the police and figures out who really committed the crime. And I just love it. I love the side characters. Although my mom has also watched it and has warned me that the side characters, some of them leave after the first few seasons, which makes me very sad. But I just finished the second season yesterday. I love that show. And if you're, like, and just about any BBC show, you see characters you recognize. Like from, I've seen people like from Doctor Who, from Merlin, from, you know, like Lark Rise to Candleford even. <laughs> um, so just different people that you'll recognize from different shows, which is always fun the pop it for an episode. I've also been enjoying watching a new podcast. It's called A Lovely Yarn Podcast and it's done by Amber. She just released her second episode. I have not a chance to watch it yet, but I will soon. And it's just, I love Amber's Instagram feed and watching her Instagram stories. And so I was really excited when she announced that she was going to be starting a podcast here on YouTube. And another thing that's like saving my life right now are Ricola cough drops. Like, I'm gonna pop one in as soon as I'm done recording because my throat hurts. Working at a daycare, you tend to get all of the colds, even if it's just you get a, like a small sore throat or sniffly nose or whatever. So, those are just really nice to have around so that to help me not get sick. So yeah, it is officially, like, dark. I mean, it's it's Maine. It's 4.15 in the afternoon. It's dark. So I'm going to go. And, yes, you can find show notes for this episode at goldberryartisans.com. And I'm also going to start putting them in the down bar down below. Just because I know I enjoy that. Especially since I watch a lot of podcasts on my phone now. It's really, it's a lot easier to follow links and stuff when it's... The show notes are here on YouTube. So for right now, I'm going to do both, see how that goes. Let me know if you prefer one way over the other. And you can find me on Instagram as Goldberry Artisans. I am on Ravelry as Emily Ruth B. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> and until I see you next time, I hope that you are making some time to create, even if it's just a few minutes, and that you are learning from your mistakes. Bye. Thank you.